So um, I've done work on, on quantified self earlier. I've, I've spent most of my um, research ca career thinking about how we tell stories online and my original background's in literature. So um, one of the things I've been really interested in is how our apps and our quantified self devices are starting to speak back to us. Um, this is Lark. Um, it's a, I don't, does anyone use Lark? Probably not. I don't think it's a hugely popular app, but it's a step counter, an activity tracker for the iPhone. Um, and as you can see, it uses this conversation-based interface, which is different from most of them, you know. Um, most of my quantified self apps look more like this. They're very sort of, you know, here's the data. I'm very objective. And note that word objective, because I'm going to return to that. They're objects, right? Um, and, and this is serious stuff, and you can trust me because I'm just the facts, I just have the numbers, and these numbers are true. Whereas Lark, as you can see, is all like, hey, Jill, hope you're enjoying your afternoon. Um, you don't actually have very many options in this. Um, the only thing I, as the human interactor, can do is click the, the button at the bottom, gotcha. <laughs> it's a fairly limited sort of script I have there. Um, but sometimes I get three options, so you know. Um, and most other apps that I've had are, are similar to like this. This is one of the first I used, 2008. It was before smartphones really existed much. They weren't very, I didn't have one anyway. Um, it was a baby napping tracker where you had to click a button on a website um, to make a, to, to say when your baby went to sleep and when it woke up. There's much more automated ways of doing this now. But even back then, it was a very sort of like just data only sort of interface. This is one of those um, automated sort of diary apps which uh, your phone just sort of tracks your location and, and where you are and what you seem to be doing and tries to give you uh, a rundown of what you've been doing every day. Here's another one here which has a different way of presenting it. But both of these, this one's much more visual, but none of them really speak as if they have agency or subjectivity, right? Now, let me see if I can get the sound happening here. I think it was supposed to come in a couple minutes. So this we just passed 30,000 amplified songs on Capsule FM. All of these are shared and enjoyed by your fellow listeners. Connect your music service and keep sharing your good taste in music. I'll just let you hear one more. This is, so this is a robot DJ, basically. Um, and I, I, I need to capture some better lines from her because this was just what she was saying this morning. Um, but... The point, this is, so this isn't exactly a quantified self app, although sometimes it is, because it says, you've liked 470 songs on Capsule FM. So sometimes it, it does the quantified thing, but mostly it's supposed to be something you listen to music on. But it very specifically has these robot DJ hosts who read you your Twitter, um, like people have spoken to you on Twitter. Um, oh, sorry, I meant to play more of that video, but... Go and check it out yourself instead later. But this is another example. This is a very clear example of like an app that's really trying to speak to you. Um, she addresses you. You can pick different um, robot voices, men, women, different um, languages, but they always address you by name. They always speak to you. And sometimes she, she really gets quite flirty, you know. Oh, Jill, I know you really love me, even though you only paid $1.99 for me in the app store. <laughs> or... Uh, <laughs> Jill, please wash your hands before you touch me again on your iPhone screen. So it's very much sort of playing with the idea that this is an artificial intelligence, but she's speaking directly to you. So this is a different sort of way of doing things. And it's also one that we're seeing, um, uh, I think, Facebook and uh, the different different big social media platforms are starting to try to use um, chatbots in order to let you access their services, which... I don't know if that's going to work, but it's a sort of approach that's um, coming. So we're starting to see this a little bit in some quantified self-apps, which makes me think about how we think about our apps. And this is where perhaps this kinship or this relationship, because it is a very intimate relationship. You carry your phone with you everywhere. You wear it against your skin if it's a wristband, right? And what, what is this doing to us? Now, the idea of the, the computer as, um, you know, of artificial intelligence is not exactly new. Um, Turing, in the, Alan Turing in the, just after the Second World War, 
um, proposed this test, the Turing test, which is like, okay, how could you tell the difference between a computer and a human if, <laughs> if you're typing to them and you can't see which has, you know, which has a human on the other end and which has a computer? And um, so people have actually managed to pass that test, you know, um, someone put a lot of money on it, and I think it was last year, the year before, someone actually passed it uh, by, but to pass a test like that, to make it, to write an AI that people can be tricked into thinking is human, you have to have a very specific sort of dialogue line, right? You have to have a very specific, like it's a very specific kind of human. Um, Eliza is one of the first of these chatbots. Gosh, it's so tiny, isn't it? I wonder if I can make that bigger. Yes. Eliza was uh, uh, written in the, I think, was it the 50s or the 60s? 50s. By, um, a computer scientist and she's scripted to be uh, like a Rogerian psycho psychoanalyst. So here she says, um, hello, I'm Eliza. Could someone tell me what to say? I'll just write, um, I am at a conference. Come on, oh, did you come to me because you are at a concert? Conference? Yes. <laughs> are you sure? Would you prefer if I were not a computer? <laughs> so she does this, she plays a very specific role, right? She just picks out some of your keywords and repeats them back to you, but adding, adding them into sentences. And this works pretty well. I mean, there are all these stories of how people have sat down and spent hours and hours every day with Eliza. There's a novel by Louisa Alcott that came out last year called Speak. It's really quite good if you're interested in AI, and also it's a fun read. Um, and it tells you the story about a world not so far, you know, the near future kind of science fiction, um, where all the children in the world were given dolls that had artificial intelligence. And everyone thought this would be great because the, the kids could have this lovely intelligent company from their dolls. But the problem was that the kids were only interested in talking to the dolls. So they stopped uh, having friends. It was like they really weren't interested in anything except the dolls. So the grown-ups decided to ban the dolls completely. And you've got this whole generation of children who are just completely distraught because those most important relationships were broken. It's a really interesting sort of philosophical read, actually. OK, so that's... Um, a little bit about AI. Now, one of the interesting things about AI and science fiction, um, I've been reading about posthumanism recently, and a lot of well, there's a lot of um, posthumanism that also uses science fiction and these science fiction um, portrayals of artificial intelligence to think through the relationship between humans and computers. And I think with quantified self apps and phones, it becomes that intimacy. It becomes a really interesting point. Um, it's technology, and technology, actually, I was going to say that this is an example of an early, um, it actually relates very directly to space and time here, because this is from 1880, it was the first time people worked out what a horse looks like when it gallops, and they worked that out because they had um, cameras, 12 cameras set to take photos, um, you know, a second apart or something like that. This is what people used to think horses looked like when they galloped, they used to think that their legs were all out like that. If you look at newer fur drawings of horses galloping, um, they're going to look like one of these images. So I was going to show you that this is an example of how the, way, the technology we use actually changes the way we see the world. But after listening to you, I'm thinking this, this really shows what happens when you spatialize time and movement. Because, and I don't have this slide in here, but um, there's this beautiful quote by um, Rodin, um, the sculptor, where he's interviewed by Paul Virilio in Paul Virilio's book, um, The Vision Machine, or Machine, The Vision Machine. Um, and, and Rodin says, uh, he's being interviewed, and someone says, well, but photography is true, right? Your sculpture art isn't true in the way that photography, this is what a horse looks like when it gallops. And Rodin said, no, because in real life, time never stands still, he said. And this is a really good point. There's these two different versions of, of truth here. And I need to reread Bergson, obviously, because he's obviously discussing similar questions. Um, because there are apps, here's another quantified self app that um, measures sex. Um, but it measures it in the ways that an iPhone is able to measure sex. That is, the duration. Oh, well, it, it measures, you put it on the bed. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it can measure movement. So it measures. Um, thrusts per second, um, or minute maybe, 
and uh, the decibel peak. Um, and so when you so and then the duration is you know how long do the thrusting movements and the decibels last? So this is a very uh, sort of bizarre version of sex, really. Uh, to most my, I mean, actually, it's the sort of version of sex you do see in some kind of hardcore porn. Um, but most people would probably experience sex differently. But this is how a, a, a phone at the moment is able to perceive it. And so if this is your sex diary, you're getting a very particular idea of what your sex life is like. Jose van Dijk um, calls this uh, dataism. She calls dataism is like this belief. It's almost like an ideology or religion where if it's in numbers, it must be true, you know? And I think this is a really useful concept to, to have. Um, to remember the sort of the power in numbers. And it's the same as what Rodin was arguing against by saying that, no, t life doesn't stand still. You can't tell all of life in photographs or numbers. Another, another um, writer or thinker I've been reading is um, Willem Flusser, who writes about the technical image, among other things. And he sees, so this is not him, obviously. This is a self-portrait by um, Germain Krull. But... I used this because of the way the camera at that time was such a big thing that you couldn't really imagine. It, it's hard to not realise how much the technology means in this situation when you've got this large camera. Flasser sees the human as sort of more like an operator of the technology rather than a subject using the technology, right? So he sees the technology as so sort of powering that the humans rarely really have a whole lot of agency or control over the technology. We're just doing what the technology allows. So that's a very sort of techno-determinist viewpoint, which actually I'm starting to lean towards <laughs> these days, <laughs> the more the internet happens. Um, although Flasser does have a gleam of hope, you know, true art can come when, you know, there's some more sort of equality happening. But so this is one view of technology. We just do whatever technology asks us to do, basically. That's it. This is a book by James Bridle, which I think is also rather interesting. He's a designer. He came up with the term new aesthetic. And um, so some years ago, um, it was revealed that the iPhone was tracking all our location data. And um, whenever you synced it to a computer, it would transfer it without. It, was, it wasn't being encrypted, and it was not very good, and so forth. Anyway, when he discovered this, no one realized until then that the location data was all being tracked. Anyway. When this was revealed, James Bridle um, downloaded all his, uh, his location data and he made this art book, um, which is, consists of maps of where he was. The title, as you can see, um, is an expression that he doesn't actually remember being all those places. So he, his take on this is, this isn't actually my diary, this is my phone's diary. And that's an interesting point if we're thinking about quantified self or even... Even the Nike fuel band on your wrist there is pretty intimate, yes, but it's tracking its movement, really, right? Okay, so this is uh, <clears throat> me on um, <laughs> breakfast this morning. I, I tried to write it out here, so I went to Snapchat because they have good emojis. So this is my attempt to just explain the main sort of points I'm trying to come up with here. <clears throat> um, Snapchat doesn't have very good emojis for, like, basic human that's not, you know gender or racially specific. So I hope you'll accept this as my human representation. OK, so I, I'm, now I'm sort of assuming most of uh, the, the phone could be other technology, but so much quantified self stuff is the phone now. So I'm just using the phone as our example. So you've got a human, you've got a phone, you've got these two things. And usually we think about it like this. A human uses a phone, right? And if you think back to high school, did you have to do this? Or was this just my school? You know, the human's the subject. Uses is a verb, and the phone's the object. And I don't know, in the 90s, my literature professors were just crazy about this whole subject, object version of the world. Um, that's clearly, there are clearly many, many takes on that. But there is this sort of assumption that, oh, well, we're the humans. We are in charge of our technology, right? So this is the sort of basic idea. We act upon the phone, and we use it. And so then, oh, maybe I wanted that one first, yeah. OK, so this is one I've been thinking about, and I'm not sure whether it works, so I'd love feedback here. This is a fairly old, I think it's from the 70s, um, Chapman, a theorist of like um, literature and film. Um, and it's his idea of, OK, you've got the text. So this is like, you know, a book or a movie or something like that. And outside of the text, you have a real author and a real reader, right? So 
let's say that movie about the dolls, for instance. She was writing, there's a real Louisa, it can't be Louisa Alcott, she's from Little Women. I must have got the name wrong. Louisa Hall, I think, sorry. Google it. Um, you've got the real flesh and blood author. Clearly somebody actually wrote the book, right? Um, and then within the text, you've got an implied author, and that's like what it sounds like. Um, actually, my example in my draft was Donald Trump, even though that's not literature or film, because it's so incredibly simple to apply. Because clearly there is a real flesh and blood Donald Trump. Who knows what his actual motivations are for running for president, right? And there's a real reader of it or viewer of his speeches. And for this case, that's all of us. Or it's many other people, but it's also you and me, right? And then there's the implied author. Um, and that's clearly a person who actually is presenting himself as actually a legitimate candidate for president, um, and he's wish, wishing to position him himself in certain ways, which aren't necessarily the same as what the real, actual flesh and blood person are doing, right? And his implicit reader is clearly not us. I mean, he's clearly not speaking to educated Europeans. That's sort of very obvious. Um, his implicit reader is somebody very different in America. So you can sort of read that out of the text. You don't need Donald Trump to tell us who the implied author and reader are. You can figure that out of the text, right? But then there might also be a narrator and a narratee. So when Trump speaks, he says, I, he's clearly the narrator. Um, if he says, you, and he occasionally in a, in a speech, he might actually speak to an individual. In that case, that's the narratee. So those, those um, positions aren't always present in the text. Anyway, so my question is, does this work when thinking about, um, th this sort of assumes that everything is a narrative, and maybe it isn't, but um, I'm, I'm just trying to think about this in this way. Because if you do that, then you could end up with like, okay, here's the medium in the middle, right? So now it's not just a person and a phone, but it's a person and a phone, and then it's someone real on the other side of it, right? Um, when I'm on Snapchat, or no, when I'm using RunKeeper, I go for a run, it's just me and the phone, but then I post it to Facebook because I want other people to see my results, right? Or I look at the feed of my friends on RunKeeper. So there is, a, there is a situation where we humans use the phone just to get to something else. And that's where it's kind of a traditional medium, not that different from newspapers, televisions, etc. And you could think of that as me being a narrator and I'm speaking to, you know, I, I want to share my runs with somebody and that somebody is my narratee because I'm sort of speaking to them about my run, right? Or you could see it as like a broadcast model, like a fairly sort of traditional few to many media model and say it's a speaker speaking to an audience. And on Snapchat, um, which I've been looking at recently, you really see that there's an interesting um, division where some people who speak to the camera on video, the teenager pointed this out to me actually, or to my friend because my friend was speaking to the video. <laughs> and the teenager said, oh, you can't do that, only celebrities do that. Which is really insightful actually, because now I've been watching everything on Snapchat, and it's true, you only speak video if you think you have an audience. If I'm speaking to an individual, it seems like maybe you don't. Anyway, so the point is, um, there's a situation where you're using it as um, a medium, right? And social media kind of is that, but in a loop. So here it's not the broadcast model, but it's like the human uses the phone to get to other humans and they speak back, right? So fair enough. Um, but we're still seeing the phone there as an object, like sort of inanimate, dead object, right? Okay, but what about these apps? Because with your Nike band, well, you, yeah, you can probably see the friends list if you want, and you could share your results. But a lot, most of your time is probably being spent just you and the app together, right? At least when I, I never share my runs. I hate that, I, but I do track them, you know? Um, and in this case, maybe we're seeing our phones not so much as objects or as media, but as companions. And this is where I need to reread Haraway and think about this kin kinship thing, too. Um, and that brought me back to diaries, because I love stories and diaries and things like that. And this um, way we used to, or still do sometimes, address the convention of addressing the diary as if the diary is a person or a subjectivity of some sort, right? And of course, we, when we write Dear Diary, we know that we're imagining it, we're projecting it. But it's like you cannot write without imagining a listener or a reader. You cannot speak without imagining someone listening to it. Even when you speak to yourself in your head, you sort of are speaking to your... Chapman would say that... Um, you... Oh, I'm not going there. No, whatever. <laughs> um, and so I think there's something there about intimacy on the one hand. Like, um, 
there's something where um, thinking of our phones or apps as obviously not humans, but some kind of subject actually makes us feel safer in sharing our secrets with them. Um, and so, and I'm, I'm thinking that largely because I'm comparing it to the diary, so I might be wrong there. But also something about just companionship. I mean, we like to, we don't like feeling alone. Nobody likes feeling alone. But if anyone of you actually did keep a diary, I, I only kept a diary when I was an angstful teenager, but um, I mean, I had people around me all the time, right? My horrible mum and dad and my awful little sister, but um, <laughs> they, they, I like them now. But, um, but there was no way I was going to share my secrets with them. I wanted a diary because it's a pure reflection of me, like it's only the things I want it to be, right? And I think there's something there about the way we're thinking about our, daps, our apps. In the, um, the other thing I did was, um, I don't have a slide of it, but I, actually, I'll just show you. Google Books, right? They, they digitized almost, I don't know, I need, I need to check exactly how large a percentage of books. But this is like, um, you can go to Google Books and search uh, words in um, print books. And they have a pretty large proportion of the world's books now. So I did a search for Dear Diary. And as you can see, um, okay, so that's like it, from 1970 to 2000, huge increase. That's kind of interesting. And then it drops after 2000. I think that's because we got the internet. So we didn't need to speak to our dear diary anymore. So I do find that somewhat interesting. OK. I think I'm almost done here. There's a lot more to think about here. And I really want to try to uh, in use more of the, like the post-humanism theory and think about these things. But there's some really interesting stuff happening in this sort of area. So I look forward to more discussion. <laughs>